In our previous video, we defined management accounting and explained it. We said it was a system that provides managers of a company information to make decisions for the company. And we also explained it by contrasting it with financial accounting. We said the big difference is the users. The users are very different and they have very different needs. Financial statement users are people like bankers who want to uh, lend money to a company, investors who are thinking about investing or selling their shares in a company, and the government who wants to tax the company. And those are all outsiders to the company and they have very different needs from insiders of a company who want to make decisions for the company. And we said because of that, insiders like very segmented, small micro information where outsiders just want the whole. They want consolidated financial information. And we also said they have different needs to be protected. There's really strict rules around how you provide information to your bank or to the government compared to how you provide information to insiders for making decisions. And in fact, there's no legal requirement that you make you know, good information available to insiders, there is a legal requirement that you make good information available to outsiders because the government wants to tax you. So uh, very different uh, thought processes go into how to prepare information for each party. Um, in this video, we're going to just continue down a typical chapter one uh, of management accounting course. Again, this might not be identical to what you cover, but uh, it's worthwhile knowing and understanding. So the third kind of piece here that we're going to look at is on globalization. And when I think about globalization and how it affects companies, just feeling around in my pocket to see if I have it, I always think about the story of this USB stick. I bought this USB stick a couple of years ago, and it really makes me think about globalization, why management accounting is important, and just the tough world of doing business in the year, you know, any year past 2000, basically. Um, so in this modern era, uh, I, and so I guess what I always do is I ask my class, I say, okay, I got this uh, USB stick. Uh, can anyone guess where I bought it? And the students often say Future Shop. And if you're not from Canada, you probably don't know what Future Shop is. It's as great as it sounds. It's the shop of the future. It's uh, like our equivalent of Best Buy. I think it's the same owners. It's our technology store. If you're in Japan, you have Yodabashi Camera. If you're in the States, you have Best Buy. And in Canada, we have Future Shop. And I don't know what you have in Australia, but uh, uh, there we are. Um, so. Uh, a lot of them say Future Shop, a lot of them say The Source or Radio Shack. Some people just say like the grocery store. You can buy these things at the grocery store now. You can buy them just about anywhere. And uh, then I say, well, where else might I buy them? And, you know, students will raise their hand. They'll say, oh, you could have bought it on Amazon or you could have bought it on eBay. Or, you know, there's a lot of different places one might buy one of uh, these guys. And, in fact, there's a lot of different places one might buy just about anything. So I... Uh, I think this is a good point to illustrate globalization. If I go back 20 years, and let's just say I'm Future Shop. Future Shop certainly existed in Canada 20 years ago, and I think these USB sticks have existed for about that long. Uh, so if I'm Future Shop and I'm, it was like probably 500 megabytes, where this is like 30 gigabytes, but anyway, uh, if I'm 20 years ago and I'm Future Shop, and I think, oh, I want to sell USB sticks to people in Kamloops. That's where I'm located. Uh, they would have to think about competing with, you know, other stores in the mall, maybe other stores down the block or across town, and maybe vaguely, like we're a few hours from Vancouver or, or Bellingham in the U.S. is a place where Canadians go to shop and they buy things a little bit more cheaply. So maybe you're vaguely competing against Bellingham. But really, like 99% of your competition is just within two kilometers of you. And 99% of your customers are probably within five or ten kilometers of you. Well, we're living in a different world now. Future Shop doesn't just have to worry about the, the Best Buy down the block. They don't just have to worry about the uh, competition downtown or the supermarkets that also sell some overlapped products. Future Shop has to really worry about Amazon, and, and an Amazon of the world frightens a Future Shop. But not only that, I'll tell you, the place I bought this was on eBay, and it came, 
uh, from a Chinese seller. I think it came from Hong Kong. And I bought it from there, and it's been a fantastic buy. And so if you think about it from, from the perspective of Future Shop, though, they're competing with somebody in a market that's a world away. This person, I don't believe, and maybe it's a bigger business than I'm giving it credit for, but I'm imagining some guy who doesn't have a store. He might have like just a, a room in his house where he moves things in and out of. Uh, and they've got to pay their employees salaries in Canadian dollars. Uh, they need to make Canadian margins to do that. They need to make a healthy margin. And they're competing against somebody selling the identical product who lives a world away in a completely different circumstance. Globalization has meant companies have to be much more competitive and they can't get away with being inefficient. So management accounting helps us use financial data to use our resources more efficiently. And, and that's one of the key reasons that management accounting has been growing in prominence. And that's one of the key reasons that management accounting is really, really important to business. So I hope I've made the point that globalization has driven competition and increased competition means that companies have to constantly be trying to, to use their resources more efficiently and more effectively. Uh, so hopefully that point is made. Um, other major themes in managerial accounting. So moving on to our fourth of our five points. There's a lot. And I've looked at various sundry accounting textbooks, miscellaneous textbooks, and they have all sorts. It's a grab bag of topics. Here are some of the topics that you'll see come up uh, all over the place. So globalization often comes up as one of those themes, but it's almost deserves prominence over that. A few others I see, uh, I frequently will see listed here, JIT, and JIT stands for just in time, uh, just in time inventory uh, methods. Uh, and so what does just in time inventory mean? It means companies try to have as little inventory as possible, because inventory costs money, and if you have inventory sitting around, it's your money is sitting around when it could be doing something else. So they try to minimize their inventory. Now, how do you minimize your inventory? Well, you order it just in time to use it and ship it out the door. You don't want to have any extra inventory sitting around. That's what the, the whole purpose of just-in-time inventory is. It's to say, look, we don't want all this extra inventory sitting around. We want the bare minimum that we can have. Now, to do it, you really have to trust your suppliers because you have to trust that they'll be able to deliver it just in time for you to crank your product out and deliver it just in time for your customer. I'll give you an example. It's not perfect just in time, but I think it, it does illustrate the point. So I was a Pepsi delivery man when I was a university student. I worked for a Pepsi warehouse here in Kamloops uh, delivering Pepsi to the stores around town. And uh, when I was a Pepsi delivery man, we had, and the department stores are totally different now, we had a department store called Woco, and it got bought out by Walmart while I was in town. And the change from Woco to Walmart actually changed the way we did things because Walmart did not want to have a lot of inventory. So here's what a typical Pepsi delivery was back then, and this is early 90s. So, you know, 20 plus years ago. Uh, so we would... You know, go to our warehouse, the company would say, hey, I want, you know, 512 packs of Pepsi, for example, you know, 12 packs of cans of Pepsi, you know, boxes of cans of Pepsi. And so we'd go, okay, great. And we'd uh, uh, put the cans on a pallet and we'd put the 12 packs on a pallet. We'd put the pallet in a truck. We'd drive to the company. So let's just say uh, it was a local supermarket. Uh, we would bring it off the truck. We would put it in the back of the local supermarket. We'd say, here are your cans. And they'd say, thank you. And they'd sign for it. And we'd move on to the next spot. Well, when we went to Walmart, we would, you know, bring the Pepsi off the back of the truck. We'd put it in the back of Walmart. We'd say, here are your cans of Pepsi. And Walmart would say, hey, our shelves are empty. Stock the shelves now. We've ordered it just in time. Like we need it now. We need it yesterday. And because they're Walmart, because they're pretty powerful at that time. And again, I don't know whether that's the policy now, but at that time we would put on a blue vest, 
we would go out to the shelves and we would stock the shelves for Walmart. Uh, again, I, I don't know whether that's uh, consistently used or if that was just a weird sign of the times, but it sure makes financial sense for them. They don't have any inventory sitting in the back. They know they have a lot of bargaining power. I know Pepsi's a huge company. Well, so is Walmart. If Walmart says jump, their suppliers say how high. And so Walmart would say, look, Pepsi, we're out of Pepsi on the shelves. We want you to get it out there on the shelves and do it right away. And they knew that Pepsi had a big economic incentive to do so. Because if Pepsi didn't put their Pepsi on the shelves and they didn't get there quickly, all the customers would just buy Coke. Well, that's not a good thing for Pepsi. So, of course, when Walmart says, hey, we're out of Pepsi, come quickly. We need it just in time. We need it right now. Pepsi would do it. They would do it straight away and uh, they would deliver right away. Well, this happens in all sorts of manufacturing. It's the reason iPhones you know, work the way they do. Uh, when, when I order a new iPhone, I, I'm an idiot who buys iPhones every year, uh, and I can track it and it's coming from a factory in China directly to me. Um, and, and, you know, it's delivered just in time. And, and, and uh, I shouldn't say that, but, but it's manufactured just in time where they receive their parts, they manufacture and deliver kind of, and everything is happening very quickly, but to minimize the amount of inventory that they're holding sitting around. So they don't want to have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of just chips sitting there doing nothing. They want to get the chips manufactured just in time to go on the phone, just in time to go out the door to customers. And the longer anything's sitting, the less efficient it is. So that's a fundamental concept in management accounting. I spend a lot longer on that than I intended. Um, a couple of other uh, concepts. Uh, TQM stands for Total Quality Management. When I think about Total Quality Management, I think about uh, trying to rethink your service uh, in terms of delivering or satisfying the customer. You're you're just it's completely service oriented and just trying to deliver the best possible service for customers. Um, another concept related is called process reengineering. Process reengineering says rather than trying to make things a little bit better, which total quality management might do, uh, or, or, and actually related to total quality management, I should note, continuous improvement, just trying, trying to squeeze out small improvements everywhere that you can. Process reengineering says, let's fundamentally rethink what we do. Let's build something new from the ground up. And it's very difficult for big companies to do this, but you see new entrants doing it all the time. Like uh, you hear about Uber or Lyft. If you Google Uber or Lyft, L-Y-F-D, their companies have just said, look, taxis have existed for a long time. We think there's a fundamentally better model now that the internet is around to just do it through an app. And um, everybody that's used an Uber or a Lyft, I think their experience has been it's better than taxis. Well, that is a re-engineering of the taxi process, right? They've said, okay, this business model, it needs to change. Uh, even checkouts, you know, you go to any store now, the checkout system is totally changed. It's not like, you know, making uh, the checkout, the um, conveyor belt at the checkout marginally faster, gets people through marginally quicker. No, they've said, look, let's have one or two staff overseeing like 20 self checkouts and let the people check themselves out and that'll be faster and, and less expensive. So they've re-engineered that process. So these are all concepts and themes in management accounting. Uh, we'll come back for one more video on just the importance of ethics in accounting.